pandemic, entrepreneurship, learning from home, interpersonal relationships, 2020 is a year for the books, a book we want to light on fire, but here we are. We still are going through it, and today's episode is with a neuroscientist who is an entrepreneur herself, understands what all y'all are going through, is going to be helping us get through naysayers, because like we need naysayers in a pandemic, but it happens, whether you are starting your business or we're just trying to grow it to success. So please join this episode. She is an absolutely astonishingly successful woman. I'm so happy we secured her as a guest. Ariel Garten is really, honestly, one of the most interesting people you're going to meet. Listen to these hats. Neuroscientist, mom, former psychotherapist, former fashion designer, and she's the co-founder and visionary of an amazing and highly successful tech startup called Muse. This tracks your brain during meditation to give you real-time feedback about your meditation and guide you into the zone. We will dig into all of this in the episode. It's just one of the tips that we're going to go through of how to deal with naysayers. But when Ariel is not reading brains, quite literally, because she's a neuroscientist, um, she is helping other startups and women in business. You can find her on stages across the world from TED Talks to MIT, teaching these audiences about their brain and how to overcome its limitations, which we know naysaying by people in our lives, whether it's other business owners or family and friends, can put limitations on us. Arielle consistently gives her audiences practical tools like she's going to give you in today's episode, which FYI is episode 133. So you're going to see tools and insights and get information in direct four quick tips to become your best self in entrepreneurship and in life. Show notes are going to be at rachelbrangy.com forward slash EPI 133. So let's dig right in. Welcome to the Business Bites Podcast, the podcast for busy entrepreneurs. Whether you're an online entrepreneur or seeking after brick and mortar success, this podcast brings you quick bites of content so you can learn and grow anywhere you are. Now here's your host, Rachel Brainke. Hey friends, welcome to another week of the Business Bites podcast. I am your host, Rachel Brinke, and I am joined with Ariel. I am excited for this topic, but FYI, segue, I say I'm excited every week, but I am because we spent a lot of time really trying to find good guests to come on. And Ariel is one of those that I think is going to knock your socks off because we are talking about busting through naysayers. We all have them. We all love to hate them, hate to love them. They're in our lives. Not often what we can do, but Ariel, I'm excited for you to come on and help my audience, entrepreneurs, navigate through this. So welcome. Thank you. It is a joy and a pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. So I have to start. I kind of gave a little tidbit in the introduction of you, but you're a neuroscientist. Trained as a neuroscientist, former psychotherapist, fashion designer, mom, all sorts of craziness. I love strong, successful women like that. So that basically is your evolution to get here. Do you want to give us kind of a snapshot of how you end up where you are? Because it'll give us some context to understand how you've gotten to ignoring the naysayers to get to success. Great. So I had entrepreneurship in my blood. As a kid, I had a lemonade stand. I was a clothing designer when I was 16 and I went from door to door, store to store with my clothing. And I had, you know, retailer after retailer say, no, of course I won't take this. What are you talking about? And one or two people say, yes, I will take your clothing. And it's like, I was 16 years old and I was a clothing designer. Then I went to New York and I did the same thing. And then I was like 19 and a clothing designer in New York. Um, Along the way, I was trained in neuroscience. I was always fascinated by the brain and how it worked and worked in research labs. And then I became really fascinated with how we get over the stuff that is in our head that holds us back. 
Um, so I worked as a psychotherapist and I had this incredible opportunity to create a device that we know, now call Muse that gives you real-time feedback on your brain during meditation that helps you understand when you're in mind wandering and not particularly helpful topics and gives you methodologies to be able to get out of that brain space. And that really became my most successful entrepreneurial venture. Um, Muse is now used all around the world by hundreds of thousands of people, translated into multiple languages and continuing to grow and flourish. That's incredible. And so you have a special promo code for our audience. It's at choosemuse.com forward slash welcome. And then the code is choosemuse10. So one zero. Y'all can go check that out. We're also going to link it on the show notes page. Uh, so you can dig into that. Man, all right, entrepreneurship, as you well know, is not a straight trajectory. Like you, you've had multiple hats, multiple things in your background, but if you could go back in time to one of your first hats that you wore or your very first business or career, what would you tell yourself or change um, that could maybe make the entrepreneurship path a little bit more streamlined or just a quicker trajectory to success? So- I would say quite honestly, I had a ridiculously quick trajectory to success. And I think that trajectory to success was partly because I was really willing to jump in and do what was needed. And I mm -hmm. didn't feel afraid to do what I had to do to move the business forward. You know, mm -hmm. I was 16 years old with no real idea how to sew, um, but with a line of clothing that I boldly took from retailer to retailer, hearing no after no after no. And I was very willing to put myself out there. I was very willing to not worry about the no's that I was receiving because I knew it just meant that there wasn't a right fit. Mm -hmm. I knew it just meant that it wasn't something about me. I just had to find the right place for this. And what? so if I had to go back in time and tell myself something, it would be that you are on the right path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would tell myself that you have the skills, the knowledge, and the capability that you need to move yourself forward. And don't I, worry about what you don't know, because there's always in the back mm -hmm. of your mind, this like, this, this worry, the, am I good enough? You know, is this going to work out? And it's those worries that never serve you. Mm -hmm. So if I could go back in time, I would tell my little self <laughs> not to worry about those things, to just keep boldly moving forward. Would you partner that with some like tangible, actionable tips to not worry? Because I feel like it sometimes it's easy to hear. Don't worry, you'll get there. It's not about you. It's other people. The opportunities are coming. But that's hard when you're sitting in those emotions, sitting in that time period. What would be an actionable, whether it's like setting a daily intention or I, mean, I, can't, I can't think of anything else. What would be an actionable step to make sure you don't succumb to that overwhelming feeling or into the wrong opportunities? I have many of them. So the first one is one of my favorites, which is killing the inner critic. So the inner critic is that little voice inside of your head that's always telling you bad things about you and actually rarely is true. It's the voice of, I'm not good enough. My hair looks stupid. My pants are wrinkled. They're not going to like me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we use it to try to motivate ourselves, especially as entrepreneurs, but it is not motivating. It is actually demotivating. It saps you of your ability to move forward. And one technique that I absolutely love is to take that inner critic out of my head, throw him or her on the wall, make a little visualization for it. It could be a you know toad or a gnome or a troll and actually communicate with it and say like, dude, you have no right to tell me these things. This is not helpful. This is not useful. I don't want you to get lost. Mm -hmm. Take your fingers and squish it down and flick <laughs> it away. So technique one, A, notice you have an inner critic. B, actively like, push against it and communicate against it because it doesn't need to take up that space in your head. And method number two is meditation. Mm. And this is really what meditation is all about. It's about identifying the thoughts that we have in our head that we get caught up with that don't necessarily serve us and frankly just cause suffering. And so with a meditation practice, you're able to observe the process of your thinking and then be able to actually make choices about the contents of your own mind to say, hey, I can see I'm having that thought and I can see that thought is not actually serving me now. I can see that thought is not necessarily helpful at this moment, useful information, but not actually helpful to me to repeat over and over and over again. And the technique of meditation teaches you to move your mind away from those thoughts and put them onto something neutral. And also to calm your body 
because anxious negative thoughts give you anxious negative feelings in your body, which then becomes a feed forward loop. So with meditation, you're able to calm the mind and then calm the body so that you break the cycle. When do you recommend doing meditations? Is this more of like a reactive approach when we start feeling these worries or feelings of insecurity, or could it be a proactive or maybe a hybrid proactive every day, but then step it up and maybe do an additional meditation um, that is specific to react to the emotion that you're feeling? You've totally got it. So meditation is a practice and you have to do it daily. You do a little bit every day and every day you build the skill. In the same way that you go to the gym and by going to the gym, you know, daily or three times a week, whatever works for you, you end up getting stronger and stronger. And then the day that you need to move the couch, you're just like, oh, I just moved the couch and vacuumed under it. (laughs) I can just lift my own couch and vacuum all the way under it without asking anyone for help. That's amazing. Felt like superwoman. Um, (laughs) And so when you do the practice regularly, you have the skills at your disposal. It's also a great tool once you've built those skills to be able to use it in the moment and to be able to use it to calm your mind and body as soon as you notice yourself getting off the wire. Mm -hmm. I think for me, I've just recently really embraced the idea of meditation. I've always been kind of, all right, let's be intentional, maybe about a word or a phrase or, and I, so I feel like maybe I was a little bit more in the killing the inner critic part of things and I've recently got into meditation and I love that it is really a hybrid approach because for me as an entrepreneur that's very like bucket driven of okay we do this and we get this result um, I don't like to be reactive and so doing the proactive portion I could see but I love and I feel free hearing you say you'll be able to have that every daily um, building of the skill but then it's not going to be perfect right you're still going to have to do that pro that reactive type of meditation to help you at that moment. Um, so for me, I'm taking notes over here for myself. I'm like, oh, meditation, let me improve my, <laughs> let me improve my skills here. Awesome. Very cool. So we've got killing the inner critic in meditation. What is another tip if you have one on this of how to not get succumb into that worry or that negative um, energy and uh, I guess just response that you have to naysayers around you? Sure. So it's very easy to take in naysayers as personal, Mm -hmm. but in a business context, you cannot look at things personally. So if I was to go in with, you know, my clothing and somebody said, oh no, we're not going to take it. It was very easy for me to look around the store and actually say, well, they have formal wear and I'm, you know, making streetwear for 16 year olds. Obviously this is not a fit. When you're in other business situations, it's harder to see where the fit and the lack of fit is. And so it may seem like you're being rejected in a way that's personal, but actually that's just not a fit for the business. Mm -hmm. So what you want to be doing is listening to areas where there's not alignment and trying to identify how you can improve alignment, but not really becoming personally involved or, you know, feeling the impact personally of times when there isn't a business fit. Now, when it comes to kind of the larger concept of naysayers, when I was building the business for Muse, I was literally telling people that I could have a clinical grade EEG that could track your brain and give you real-time feedback on your meditation. And this was like in the early 2000s. And people thought I was completely nuts. (laughs) I am five foot two with, you know, long hair, little female in Toronto, female tech CEO from Canada. Like, where's that? Silicon Valley. Standing in Silicon Valley in front of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, you know, asking for millions of dollars. And so that is a situation that you can think is setting yourself up for naysaying and like, why on earth would you put yourself in that situation? But as much as I heard a bunch of no's along the way, which range from people being like, wow, this seems completely crazy to like, hmm, this is really interesting. We're really interested, but not right now. I ultimately was able to raise $18 million for the business personally by persisting in that activity of standing in front of these Silicon Valley VCs learning, getting better at my own skills of pitching, understanding the industry, understanding their needs and moving forward. Mm -hmm. So just because you hear no, doesn't mean you should run away. Doesn't mean the whole thing doesn't work. I I was literally hearing from people, you know, if I really read through their words, like, what is this tiny little female who with no real (laughs) background with this crazy idea doing, asking me for millions of dollars. And ultimately those are VCs who invested in me years later. 
So it's really just adjusting of the messaging. And I know that's one thing I have immensely learned in my business this year when I'm making pitches and talking is that oftentimes if I've done my steps to, like you were talking about, I'm not necessarily going to walk into a tuxedo store and try to sell them on a fitness line. You know, as long as I know that it's in line with what their potential avatar is and their unique selling proposition, if there is resistance or a no, it's in the messaging somewhere. And there's somehow we're not communicating effectively to one another. I love that encouragement because I feel like well, A, people often, and I'm raising my hand myself because sometimes I go through these cycles and I'm sure you do too, you feel scared to put yourself out there. And so you either don't or you do it ineffectively. And so it's really being really formulaic, but then stopping, like you said, and when you hear a no or a naysay, look at it, evaluate, is it my offer? Is it my messaging? Or is it truly just not a good fit? I mean, and if you get to truly not a good fit, no sense of continuing to pursue because it's not going to result in much of anything, then you're really going to be meditating daily because <laughs> it's not going to be a good fit. That's going to be a lot of reactive meditation. Um, so I love that approach for business. How would we apply that when we have naysayers with like our friends and family? Um, before you do that, I want to add a fourth reason that somebody could say no, um, that they're a jerk and filled with bias. Ah, I like that one. It's real. It really happens. And as a small female tech entrepreneur, I definitely encountered no's for that reason. And those are the reasons, those are the no's that actually embolden you. Those are the no's where you're like, this person said no because they don't see what I'm doing or believe mm -hmm. in it or, you know, have some amount of bias that is completely crazy. And those are the no's that don't make me turn away. Those are the no's that make me stronger. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love that. Well, let, let's talk on that for a second before we get back to the family and friends type stuff. So how do you overcome that? I mean, it sounds like you didn't overcome it like directly with them trying to win the jerk over. You just simply harness the power and the energy of that and used it to fuel you elsewhere. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't allow it to push me away from the activity overall. It wasn't like, okay, all these, these are jerks. I'm stepping away from pitching from in Silicon Valley ever again. Um, you know, I went to the next one and, and ultimately found somebody who I connected with and could see it and built mm -hmm. a relationship with. So personally, in terms of the internal sensations, it's like just because one person feels this way, that their experience, I'm not going to allow myself mm -hmm. to take that in. I'm not going to allow it to make me feel bad about myself or what I'm doing. That is just their experience, which is why putting them in the category of jerk really helps. It's a, it's them, not me problem. <laughs> For sure. And actually creatives that are listening, I know this as a creative individual myself, really re-listen to what she just said. If you have to go back 15, 30 seconds, because it's really important to not automatically attach that um, energy and that attitude and the naysay from that one person to others. Um, you know, you have been, you are proof, Ariel, of the success of going into Silicon Valley and basically allowing the jerks to be the bumpers down the bowling lane, right? They kept you guiding you to where you needed to go of who you actually needed to um, get into business with. So don't just go out and pitch or make it, you know, try to pursue a business opportunity and you bump up into a jerk and you just give up. That's not going to happen, um, especially now. You know, I don't want to get too much in the pandemic talk, but I feel like we're starting to see in business, there's a lot of heightened stress. Um, there's a lot of heightened stress and personal, and I'm seeing it creep into business opportunities. And it may not, not so much from a boundary standpoint, which is very important, but when we're talking about the jerk category, people are becoming very jerkish and, or they're not intending to come off that way, but they are because of real life situations. I, I definitely would take Ariel's advice where she just said, like, not to take it to heart, but use it to guide you to someone else because you don't need to pursue those that it's not going to work with. All right. So just to recap real quick on that, we have killing the inner critic. We have the meditation. We have proactive and reactive um, daily building the skill. Um, don't take it personal. And then obviously you're going to encounter jerks and bias and you using as fuel to the fire. I do want to touch on before we wrap up this quick bite of how do you not take the naysay personal when it's coming from family and friends? That can be a really hard one. But that's when meditation really, really helps. 
because we're in a place where we tend to want to please the people in our life. We tend to want to please our family and please our friends. And so we get pulled emotionally because we're afraid of being seen by our family or friends as wrong and therefore not being loved because they think we're doing something wrong or we're not appropriately pleasing them or doing what we're supposed to do. So the practice of meditation helps you really disattach from other people's emotional experiences subjecting to you and to be able to sort through your own experience and say, this is mine, this is theirs, I don't need to take that on. Mm -hmm. You know, I might be feeling a bit of upsetness or sadness or noticing the need to please arising, but I'm noticing that need, I know where it comes from, and it's not actually the truth of me. Mm -hmm. and the truth of what I want to and need to be doing right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, what's interesting is I feel like even, and I'll give you a personal example here in a second, but I feel like we, it's so easy to fall into um, mainstream perceptions. For example, I mean, when going through um, school and everything, even in law school for myself, the idea was you're going to get a nine to five, you work for a corporation and that's how you become successful. And obviously I haven't been doing that for over 15 years and I've done very well for myself. And I, there were naysayers and skepticism, you know, within my family my friends and my circles in the very beginning. Some of that also had to do with the timing. That was my space days before online entrepreneurship was really a thing. But I honestly found myself this last week being almost a naysayer. And I'm glad I caught my myself because I was falling into that default of what these mainstream perceptions have always taught us. My son, who's 15, he helps with the podcast and takes pictures for me and earns money that way. He's really been wanting to get into YouTube. And I found myself automatically falling into naysay category in my mind, didn't say it to him, but of well, what kind of career is that? And I had to, I literally stood in the kitchen, almost smacked myself because I was like, why would I be a naysayer when I'm doing this with a podcast? <laughs> You know, so I think, I think for me also recognize sometimes that when people speak where they're not providing the support or there's skepticism that comes out that they may be fighting their own ingrained. Cause that's what I was ingrained my whole life. That's what I had to do. And I'm, even though I've been doing it for almost two decades, it's still sitting there. And so I'm making an intention to not pass that, you know, naysay onto my son. But yeah, I just thought that was interesting because I've always like championing myself and being very, um, encouraging of entrepreneurship and I fell right into that. Yeah. And so another way to help undo that and the people around you is if you're comfortable to have an honest conversation about mm -hmm. why this is important to you. Mm -hmm. so, you know, if your son came up to you and said, this is really important to me, mom, because I think I can learn this, this, and this from it, or because mm -hmm. I need to try this in my life for some reason, or I want these outcomes and I know it might fail, but to show somebody your perspective and why you're approaching this um, can be very helpful to getting them on side, even if they don't agree with what you're doing, at least right. to understand why you're doing it and to help them stop their own reactivity that causes them to just say, no, that's a terrible idea. Yeah, you know, I think that's one of the things too that I see in entrepreneurship, um, whether it's from business to business or with family and friends, entrepreneurs feel unsupported. And I sometimes I don't think that it's unsupport. It's that they're, those individuals, especially families and friends, are not in this space, so they don't understand it. They don't see the value of it. And so that, like what you just said, explaining why you want to do it and what the value, like for me, the value that it adds to my life. It allows for me to be, like right now during a pandemic, I'm doing learning from home with my children in the mornings, and it's wonderful. Sarcasm font, it's, it's very <laughs> frustrating. But I have the opportunity to get to do that whereas many others don't. So that's a value add for me. And even now I'm finding telling my family and friends, I'm like, hey, look, this, you know, by doing this for all these years has afforded me this opportunity now so that they can see the value. Because uh, remember, we work this every day. We're working the business. We know the value. We see it. The outside doesn't see it because they're not working it all the time. Yeah. And another way to soften the blow to yourself is to remember that the person is saying it out of care. Mm -hmm. Care might be totally misplaced and misaligned, and the way they're communicating mm -hmm. that care seems crazy to you, but the bottom intention is because they care for you. You can take a moment and sit with the fact that this person really loves you and is saying this out of care, and then be able to let go of the actual content of it because it is misaligned with an understanding of you and your mm -hmm. needs. Yes, for sure. Because that was actually part of what my son said. He goes, I don't want everyone to know how much I'm making. And initially I thought, was well, he think he's going to make millions of dollars? And then I stopped and went, 
no, he might be potentially embarrassed in the build stages that he's not making enough. So yeah, I just, I, I, it's so funny. I'm learning so many lessons during, <laughs> during pandemic and having a teenager, but I love these steps. These are wonderful because not only just being able to be the one that's receiving naysay, uh, but also I don't become the naysayer for other people. I love this. Absolutely enjoy it. Again, Ariel, thank you for coming on. This was a good bite of information to help because I know that this naysay aspect and how you can impart those feelings on yourself as an entrepreneur doesn't go away. Whether you're very first in um, business or you're 10, 15 years down the road, unless you're intentional and you take steps just like she outlined for this guy, so make sure you re-listen, it will pop up and you wanna be able to manage it as much as possible. Um, Ariel, tell us a little bit about Choose Muse. I mean, you kind of touched on it and we have the code at choosemuse.com forward slash welcome. You can use the discounts code choosemuse1010 for 10. You want to give us a little bit of information on what that is and how entrepreneurs can fit that into their daily business? Sure. So Muse is a brain sensing headband that helps you meditate. So we've talked a lot about meditation. We all know it's good for you, but meditation can be really hard to do. You know, you sit there, your brain bounces all over the place and there's no little guru sitting inside your head telling you what you're supposed to be doing or when you're in the meditation zone or if you're doing it right. So with Muse, we solve that problem. We are able to give you real-time feedback, audio feedback to let you know when you're focused in the meditation zone and when your mind is wandering. Mm. And then and we have literally hundreds of guided meditations from workplace stress, dealing with the pandemic, dealing with kids, college collections, morning joy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Muse actually gives you real-time feedback from your brain during meditation, lets you track your stats, lets you see your improvement to help you either start if you've never meditated before. Best way to meditate because it's meditating with data. It shows you how you're doing. <laughs> lets you track your KPIs and your improvement and like you know you're being really efficient in each section and like really getting your meditation on. I love that. Well, can I ask you, is there like an Uber model or can I make a feature request that it zaps me when I start drifting off in my brain and I'm not focusing because I sit down and I'm like meditation and then 30 seconds, I'm like, got to go to the grocery store. I got to do this. I need like a zap, like a dog collar zap. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't dog collar zap, but you're hearing audio that's reflective of your Good. state. So when you start thinking about the grocery list, you hear a storm pick up and mm. that's like your audio zap. That's like, oh, right. Brain back to my breath. I and love that. You. Yeah, it trains you to stick with your breath and out of those wandering thoughts. That's incredible. So how did you, I mean, you kind of briefly touched on this at the very beginning of the episode. How did you come into creating this? So I was working as a psychotherapist and at the same time worked in the lab of Dr. Steve Mann. He's the inventor of the wearable computer. And he had a brain computer interface system that we were using to really audibleize brain activity. So when mm -hmm. you were focused or you were relaxed, we could play different tones. And I looked at this and said, this is extraordinary. The world needs to know about this and yeah. set about with my co-founders applying this technology to meditation. And it's been like, off the chart successful. That is incredible. Well, thank you so much for your time. I know you're extremely busy. This is a wonderful tool and I am super excited. I honestly, now is probably like the perfect time y'all listening to, you're not going anywhere. You're in pandemic. Most of us are shut down. Now would be a perfect time to really commit to these steps that we've outlined, especially with meditation and especially getting a hold of one of the Choose Muse headband so you can make sure that you are being as effective and having that wonderful data that as entrepreneurs crave. So thank you so much for coming on. Listeners, y'all, I'm ha I'm so excited that you're on this week. You've stuck with us. Make sure you jump into the Business Bites Facebook group. As always, we will have a thread specific to this episode. And I really want to hone in and hear your real life examples of things that you're dealing with and how you're applying these steps. I'm going to share my own application of this when this podcast launches. So go in there. You'll learn a little bit about me. I want to learn what you guys have learned from this episode and how you've applied it into your business. Thanks for joining Rachel on this episode of The Business Bites. For show notes, a list of recommended tools or referenced episodes, you can find them at businessbitespodcast.com. Until next time.